Hi, thanks for watching the Los Angeles Times Envelope Emmy Contenders Chat Series. Against all odds, I am Michael Ordonia. We've cleared out all the letter openers from the set in anticipation of today's guest, two-time SAG and three-time Emmy nominee, all for his work as Douglas Stamper on House of Cards, Mr. Michael Kelly. Thank you. Welcome. Be here. Thanks for coming. Um, and we are going to talk about some of the stuff we were talking about before. Totally fine. Um, <laughs> for fans of the show, I just want to warn you, um, there is some spoiler stuff that's going to come out. And if, some, if for some bizarre reason you have not yet finished the series, then just pause this video, go back and finish House of Cards, then come back and watch this interview. <laughs> I figure you're kind of past the veil of spoilers. At this point. I, I always say that. It's like after a certain point, you're just like, all right. Either you're going to watch it or you're not, and <laughs> well, spoilers are coming. Sorry. Look, the Russos let people spoil Endgame two weeks after it came out. Yep. It's more than two weeks. There you go. Um, so I really want to talk a lot about your portrayal of Doug. Um, Doug is, he's definitely not an easygoing guy. Um, but I want to say that your portrayal of him seemed easy to me and that it seemed natural. It, I never felt like you were pressing to play this guy who, who seemed pretty tightly wound. Uh, I wonder if that's haunted you in life. Do people confuse you with the character? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's <laughs> always somebody who's caught off guard on their phone and is just like, you know, uh, <laughs> that, that moment of like, oh my God, am I really standing next to this, this nut job? Um, yeah, but I, you know, I think in order, in order for people to be able to relate to the character, I wanted to ground him in a reality and a, you know, bring more, as much of myself to the character as I could while remaining faithful to the character. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why there is that, that, that sense of, of people wanting to root for this character sometimes, even though he's doing these sometimes heinous acts. It's mm -hmm. because, you know, I had to believe that he was a good person, that he was doing what he believed to be the right thing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I had to make him make sense for me. I think that might be the, the center of the target about why people would root for him, because um, he, he does seem to be acting out of belief. But I, I would say, though, that it's key that he's a creature of addiction. 100%. So I Everything say, yeah. for him. Everything is centered on, on addiction. Work and alcohol and women and every aspect of his life, anything that he does, he does with full force and dedication, right? So f from the love of Rachel in whatever weird way that was love, you know, uh, or alcohol or his job, you know, his dedication to Frank is because he wants to be the best he can at his job. Mm -hmm. He wants to do what he believes is right. And, and as, as an actor, that's something you can you can grab a hold of, you know, you're like, well, you ask sometimes the writers, like, what? I'm having a very hard time <laughs> wrapping my head around this particular, why is he doing this? And, you know, you have to go back to that and, and that, that disease of addiction, and what, what, which it is. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes everything make sense. Well, it's, uh, I would say that his main addiction, at least in the show, is to Frank. Mm -hmm. to, and... Um, that makes it very interesting that, spoiler alert, he killed Frank. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but again, it's to the job, right? It, it did become, in the final season, really about um, his job took him to protect. Uh, that dedication to Frank often was a byproduct of his dedication to his job. At the end, I believe that he did sort of start to lose it a little bit in wanting to his addiction and main focus became protecting the legacy of the man. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, what was his whole adult life work about? If the legacy of the man was not what he thought it was, then what, what, what did he spend his whole life doing? His whole adult life doing? Mm -hmm. you know, and I think for him, that's sort of what pushed him to where he went in the end. I'm actually interested in what that, that legacy is, because the show, didn't dwell on policy specifics. I mean, a number of bills come up during the show, but mm -hmm. they're only uh, discussed in broad strokes. It's not like the West right. Wing. Right, you know? right. So I wonder, what is that legacy? What is the thing that they built together? 
Well, I think, you know, look, he believed in, in, in the policy and the Ways and Means and the Education Act and all the different things that they worked on together. And he believed that that man was the best president for the country at that time. Mm -hmm. So serving that was an easy thing to do. Um, and I think the legacy being what you leave behind as a president, what your name will be, how you will be remembered as a president. And I think to a certain point, Doug believed that that legacy was going to be a great legacy and something that people will look back in retrospect and say, that was a great president that mm -hmm. we had. And when it all starts to go at the end, he can't grapple with that. He can't handle what's happening and, and how she is willing to, Claire is willing to just let it all go mm -hmm. and just be like, no, he wasn't. And he had nothing to do with why I am who I am. And that to Doug at the end is like the biggest dagger. Mm -hmm. You know, he goes into that off, he goes into the, the Oval Office saying, here's everybody who wants you dead. And all I want is the pardon for Frank. And that will protect the legacy of this man. The pardon will protect it. She says no. And he's willing to even settle for, then just say that he made you. Just admit that you are who you are today because of Frank Underwood. She's like, no. And at that point, it's like everything, his whole world as he knows it, just crumbles around him. And he's admitted to killing him. He's, yeah. you know, and, and what does he have left? And he knew that going in, mm -hmm. or at least I had to do, play that as the character. I knew going in that I had one of three outcomes, you know. Uh, and, it, and it was, it's hard to go through. It was, that was probably the most challenging day of work that I had, you know over the course of those six years uh, was, you know, knowing those three outcomes and <laughs> one of them's going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it was difficult. It was I'd say tough. it's pretty cool as you say that he was losing a little bit in season six, doubtlessly because of what he did between seasons five and six. Sure. And, you know, we meet him in season six, he's bearded. And, <laughs> I mean, he's a little unibombery. <laughs> and then, uh, as you say, he's hurtling toward the, one of those three outcomes. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the culmination of what I saw as his rivalry with Claire through the entire series. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it's got to be fun playing that with Robin Wright. I mean, you know, she is, uh, she, she's a, a thrilling, exciting director mm -hmm. to work with, to, to be that. We, 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 uh, a lot of people don't know that about her. Mm -hmm. Um, she directed more episodes than anyone of House of Cards. I didn't know she directed in, in the more end, she was. It was James Foley, and then Kevin's producing partner, Danny Burnett. He stole um, James Foley away to go do the uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, and so Robin then became uh, the one who directed more than anyone. And she is a, a, a true actor's director, someone mm -hmm. you want to work for, someone who helps you, you know, gets in there with you, nitty gritty, and, and helps you find these great moments um, but as an actor yeah I mean you know almost all my stuff before was with Rachel and Frank and then to Rob and I had very little together until the latter seasons yeah. and then the last season I was just like oh my god I get to do you know <laughs> talk about a silver lining uh, with everything that happened with the show was that I got to act opposite someone who I hold on such a high pedestal as an actor I, I just felt that through the series, they were they were always battling it out for uh, Frank's belief and and attention. I wonder if early on in Frank's knowing Claire or or your knowing them, that uh, that Doug recognized who she really was. Oh yeah, I think he always saw her at, and knew what she was capable of doing. Um, and I think it's why if you look back and you follow the trajectory of. Doug's relationship with Claire from season one, mm -hmm. it was always, I have, I'm watching you. I know what you're capable of doing. I know a lot of what he does is because of you. <laughs> um, so it, it, that was, I was very grateful as an actor for them to be able to, to play that clash with the two of these characters in the end because in my mind, it had been building for, for five seasons prior. Well, of course, they. Season six was drastically rewritten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but when you look at it th this way, through the lens of, that we've just been looking at, it makes sense that you killed Frank. So, um, <laughs> yeah. but how did, you, how did you react when they came to you and said, oh, you did it? 
Yeah, you know, it kind of, like many things with this final season, uh, a lot of props to Frank and Melissa, our showrunners and head writers. Um, what they were able to do in two short months, you know, completely rewrite a season without your lead character, I give them that most respect. Um, but, oh wait, what was the original? Or uh, how you reacted when how, you so, so, like much of the season, it was, we were kind of doing it as we went along. <laughs> and so, you know, I think there was that first scene where I say, to, I say to Claire in the bedroom, I say, whoever killed Frank will get what he or she deserves. Mm. And we didn't exactly even know at that point. Oh, really? Who had done it. And, and, or we hadn't completely locked it down as to the fact that it was me. Or at least they didn't tell me. Because I was like, I'm saying this. Did I, did I do it? No. Oh, you asked yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was talked about, but it wasn't really set in stone. Um, but yeah, look, it, it made sense that here's this character who was willing to do anything for this man, mm -hmm. anything to protect that legacy, forever, for always protected Frank. It made sense that he would do what he did. He was losing it. He was going to do something drastic and bad to completely ruin his legacy. And Doug was willing to do the ultimate thing to, to prevent that from happening. You know, you could say he's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. I always had to make it make sense to me. Yeah. I got it. I understood. It seemed like there was an alternate uh, choice there for Doug, though. Let, let Frank kill her and then, and then fall on the sword and say, I did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't, he didn't make a choice. So when, when did you find out, since you didn't know when the season began oh, reshooting? I, I don't remember exactly, but it was probably around six, oh. episode six. Uh, that's pretty late. Yeah, and I mean, we, you know, we didn't, I, I don't believe we had a conclusive ending until around then anyways, you know, it was really, I mean, I remember we were filming sometimes and um, we'd finish a scene and Robin and myself, Frank and Melissa would get together and be like, okay, all right, so if that happened, then, then this path has to go like that or that path has, you know, it was wow. really, uh, yeah. On it, the fly. It, yeah, I mean, they had to, you know, God bless them for what they were able to pull off. It was, it was incredible. Um, they couldn't possibly have known everything in that short two months leading up to restarting production again. Well, yeah. Because well, we had shot two episodes with him. That's right. They had 13 episodes done. And Written. yeah, I mean, at least completely storyboarded. Mm -hmm. Nine, I think, were, if I'm remembering exactly correctly, nine, I think, were fully written. Thirteen were totally storyboarded and, and ready to roll. Shot, we're in the middle of shooting one and two because we cross board, and the news breaks, the hiatus happens, and then they're like, okay, you have two months to <laughs> rewrite your whole story without your lead actor. I mean, what a. Obviously, for the show, what a total, I don't know what you call it, cataclysm, yeah. world-changing uh, event. And for you as an actor, since, it, as you say, most of your stuff is with yeah. him, with mm -hmm. Kevin Spacey, since Rachel Brosnahan is not around anymore, yeah. thanks to you. <laughs> yeah, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's that adjustment like? I mean, you're dealing with the shocking news. You're dealing yeah. with the show just being turned upside down, and now your number one scene partner isn't there. Right. It was tough. It was tough. It was, you know, that was, uh, I, I'd say, you know, I went to a bit of a, especially when the news first broke, a little bit of a dark place myself, you know, just like, <laughs> what's going on? And how do you, as an actor, as a person, as everything, deal with, these, with what's happening? Um, and I guess I'm very thankful that that immediately transitioned into my focus very quickly shifted to that crew who had been out of work for over a year already. We took a long hiatus. Mm -hmm. um, and their families, you know, I mean, it's not an L.A. and it's not a New York crew. This is Baltimore and there's not a ton of production. And they were counting on this money and their families who I now know. Mm. You know, this crew, I, I was so tight with this crew and I love, respect these guys. I still talk to these guys. Some of the Teamsters and I still text, they come to work in New York now and I'll, I'll go see them on set. Like, I, I loved my crew. So it very quickly became about, like, not only how do we get them back to work, but how do we, how do we finish this show that was, you know, a lot of people forget that it was, 
it was Netflix's first original streaming show. <clears throat> that, that was only six years ago and how that landscape has changed. But how do you let this flagship show just die because of one person's actions? And mm -hmm. that became something to me that I was like, this is unacceptable. We can't not finish this show. Mm -hmm. We can't not put all these people out of work. We can't not, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't keep these people out of work. You know what I mean? And it, and it was just, I was I was thankful that I was able to channel my energy and my focuses, and I called Robin and I said, "We got it." And she's like, "I'm on it." What is she like? <laughs> I'm, I'm already talking to people, and I was like, "All right, <laughs> anything I can do to help, you know." And and uh, and we all just everybody hit it from every angle, and Netflix and MRC were on board, and so it was like. And even when we went back to work, you know, people were like, "Well, what was it like without him there?" I was like, "We didn't have time to think about what it was like without one of the characters there." It, it was about shit, how do we do this? How do we, how do we finish this show? Yeah. Um, and do what's right for the audience who's lo loved and, and, and watched this show for five years. You know, how do we finish it right? I think even uh, casual watchers of the show, not, not people who are uh, big fans and, and not people who are invested in, in the livelihoods of, of the uh -huh. people involved, I think they, most of those people would agree you gotta finish the show. I mean, yeah. you can't let what one person did right. destroy the, the whole right. thing. Yeah, so. So this question is not related to that, although it could sound like that, <laughs> uh, because I think one of the <clears throat> one of the themes that runs through most of the series and is really clear in season six is uh, the notion of what you do to get what you want. Mm -hmm. In the Machiavellian cliche, do the ends justify the means? Right. And then something that I think the uh, the showrunners delighted in doing was putting putting people who are called liberals, people who are called Democrats in, in positions that they wouldn't associate with them. <laughs> it, you know, in this season they're... Maybe living vicariously. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this season they, you know, they're uh, beholden to uh, two family members who are very rich and uh, are buying policy, which is not... Uncommon in our yeah. political practice. Yeah, let's yeah. say that. <laughs> Um, but she installs a, an all-female cabinet and says that she has this progressive agenda, which, as I say, we don't really go into. But the way she gets there is... Uh... I know, right? I mean, here's, here's a, you know, everybody, I think, well, a large portion, the majority of our country, I think, wanted to see a female president. We finally got to see one on a show, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but here is a woman, you know, and she, and this is maybe the stamper in me, but that might... She's awful. She's stepping on and crushing people yeah. to get to where she feels like she belongs. Um, and in, in my mind, it's, 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 it's the irony of here we finally have a female president and what we all kind of really want, right? Mm. But yet she's this awful, <laughs> awful person <laughs> doing awful, awful things to get, to get that. Well, know? she's a criminal. She's, right. she's a, a killer and she... <laughs> 100%. She's anti-democratic small d. Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's funny. It's funny like that. So do you think that's something that the, the show owners delighted in, uh, taking those positions and flipping them? I think, I mean, I think that was, you know, look, I, I can't speak for the writers, but I, I think if you look back at our show, you know, the, the writers always doing things that, that, uh, that surprise you, that, that you don't think are going to happen. And I, it was one of the things I loved about him was picking up a script and being like, wait, what? Why? <laughs> no, like, why would I do this? And having to, as an actor, wrap your head around the challenges of doing something that's completely unnatural to you as mm -hmm. a person, but not to your characters. God, I hope it's unnatural to you as a person. <laughs> yeah, no, believe me, all of it. Uh, you know, there's, there's, here's a guy who literally, I think, smiled once in the series. And, and you, from talking to me in 10 minutes, like, I never stopped smiling. I'm a pretty happy dude. It was like, to play that on a, a you know, six months out of, out of every single year for the last six years, to go into that just, you know, yeah. dead, <laughs> dead place. Uh, it was challenging, man, because, you know, they'd say cut, and I'm just cutting up and laughing. And not to say I wasn't very serious at work, but. Oh, you're a professional, definitely. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean. But that yeah. actually, that's uh, I meant that as a compliment that yeah, the, the performance you. seemed easy while he's not an easygoing guy at all. Yeah, no, he's not. <laughs> we see plenty of uh, you know actors playing the heavy characters who are called the heavy. Doug doesn't even feel like the heavy, even though he's a 
fucking thug and he, <laughs> he's gangster, man. <laughs> he will literally kill for Frank. He does. Uh, but it, yeah. it doesn't feel like uh, the actor is going, now I'm going to be tough. Yeah. It's just like, I think you're right. It kind of goes dead. And that's scarier. Yeah, and that's that. That's a you know I, I've said this before, but I I, I always want to give him props. You know, Bo Willeman helped me create that character with hmm. two simple things that he said to me when when he called to congratulate me on getting the job, mm -hmm. um, and and he said um, he said I'm sure you have a million questions. I was like, yeah, of course I do. I said I said, but maybe you should tell me what you think. And he said, well, I just I don't want you to emote for season one. I just, I don't want to see any emotion out of this character at all. Oh. And I want everyone at the end of season one to be like, what the fuck is up with this guy? <laughs> and I said, oh, all right. And I, from that is how I built everything about him. His walk, his voice, his demeanor. Those two simple things that he gave me, those two golden nuggets. Um, I was like, oh, I completely understand this man, you know. I think I missed one of the nuggets. One is don't emote. What was it? Don't emote. And at the end of season one, I went, oh, yeah. Does, uh, that, which lent to the mystery, the mystery of the character right. was I want everyone to be like, what is up with that guy? <laughs> you know, so I knew that he had to be mysterious and it sort of was like why he's kind of behind and lurking and, you know, he watches and, and, and a lot of the, a lot of my homework for the character, especially in the early seasons, where I didn't say a lot, was, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna be this mysterious, non-emoting character, I have to internalize a lot of this stuff. So my homework was to, you know, if I'm in a scene and Frank's in there with several congressmen and women and he's trying to push an agenda, my homework was to know how I felt about every single person in that room. Mm. And when they opened their mouth, I knew what I was thinking and how I would try to uh, not emote those feelings, but show in a way how I was feeling about them without talking a mm -hmm. lot, you know? And, uh, and it helped me further develop the character that, that way. Well, it's definitely effective to have him not be demonstrative when he's killing a dog and <laughs> no more pain. <laughs> mercy. It was a well, because we don't, we don't feel like he's a mustache trolling villain. Right. He's like, no more pain. Right, yeah. Right. It's just so simple and it's like, the dog's going to die. There's a, I hate people misuse the word dichotomy, they use it too often, but there, there's a, a dichotomy, in Frank, that's interesting that I think explains some of that, that he has this addictive personality and addictive personalities are often defined by lack of control, mm -hmm. but he's a control freak. I mean, he's, he, he has sort of contingencies for all of these right. eventualities. So it seems like he, like a lot of his energy, goes toward harnessing those, those addictive urges and, and making more gear. You mean, you mean Doug? Doug. Yeah, yeah. God, did I say yeah. Frank? Yeah. Doug. It's, it's okay. Doug. It's all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's what it, it seems to me. And yeah. you're describing him being in that room and it, I, it I picture him listening to each person, and maybe he hates him or what, but but that he's um, he's plotting. He's thinking this is yeah. this is how to deal with that person. How am I going to exactly? How am I going to further his agenda mm -hmm. by dealing with each of these people on an individual basis? All right. Um, which is <laughs> without talking sometimes a difficult thing to do. But it, that that's that's what you you know as an actor. I feel like, you know, sometimes you can be incredibly powerful when you have one line in a scene yeah. with, uh, and it could just be yes sir and, and walking out the door with the people. Being present when you don't have lines is far more difficult than being present when you do have lines, <laughs> at least for me as an <laughs> actor, you know. Being in the moment and trying to convey feelings without words is much harder than talking. Well done. <laughs> uh, all right, last, last thing I want to ask you about, House of Cards. Um, you've often talked about your, your scenes with, uh, with Rachel, the character and the actress. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, you know, it's easy to see why. I mean, there's, it's such a, uh, a different side of Doug than we see with anybody else. He's not like that with anybody else. Right. So apart from the scenes with Rachel, can you uh, name a scene or a moment or or an, even an episode that you feel like um, defines Doug, shows the stamp of Doug? Yeah, I, you know, 
you, you know that her what was the young actress's name who played her lover? Uh, Kate, uh, oh, I'm never gonna remember. She's so talented. But I, I do remember one scene where Rachel was gone, and she was going down, uh, walking down an alley with the groceries, and he goes there with the intention to kill her because mm -hmm. he knows that she knows almost as much as as Rachel knew, or could possibly know. Um, and he lets her go. And I, I just remember that scene, and I think it's because she's so good. Uh, and I, I think it was really, a, that was a real reflection of him and the struggles that that man dealt with. Because here's a guy, he's, I'm gonna kill her. I have to kill her. And he doesn't do it. And it's, it's sort of, to me, was like one of those things where it's like, wow, that's, that's what this guy lives with. Mm. You know, that's the emotional shit that just lives in his head and that he has to live with mm -hmm. um, on a daily basis. And, and you see everything kind of just get worse for him as, as the seasons go on. Mm -hmm. You know, Frank even turns his back on. Everyone just sort of, he's this, you know, they, when, when or the moment when, when Frank and Claire have him over for dinner, and he knows something's up. He's never been to the White House for dinner, mm -hmm. which in and of itself is very weird if you think about it and, mm -hmm. and how he must have, what that must have made him realize when he went to that dinner. It was like, wait, I'm going to the White House for dinner. And then like, why have I never been to the White House for dinner, you know? And then there's this chummy dinner and she's all sweet. And he's like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, and then she's, you know, says you, you got to take the fall. And I remember Frank and Melissa coming to me and saying, what? would Doug do mm -hmm. if asked to take the fall for murder? He would, of course he'd do it. Like instantly, I said, that's what a chief of staff does. Mm -hmm. They take the fall for the president. So once we'd agreed on that, it was like, okay, how? And, and is it her or is it him that's asking him to take the fall? And uh, if you remember, she asks, mm -hmm. Claire asks, because he can't say the words, uh, Frank can't say the words. And then Frank pulls him inside and said, don't worry, I'm never gonna let anything happen to you or whatever he says to him in the office. Mm -hmm. um, but that humanity, I feel, of the character when he's asked, and he's like, I need a minute. You know, like, he says yes, but it's that, the guy's just always struggling. Like, I always, I always kind of felt really, yes, he did horrible things, but I felt badly for him so often, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think as an actor, you have to identify with your character that way. That, that's such a total betrayal, of course. Yeah. <laughs> You're just like, oh man, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I did everything for you. You want me to do hard time. Um, okay, uh, there's just one other thing before I hit you with a lightning round. Mm -hmm. You're working on uh, Jack Ryan. Yeah. What can you tell me about season two? Anything you can tell me that's, uh, that will make people go, oh, I want to see season two of Jack Ryan? I, I think, you know, for those people who watch season one, you know, you're going to get more of, of, I don't mean more of the same in a negative way, more of the same in a good way, that mm -hmm. there's action and it's fun and it's uh, uh, incredibly dramatic. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I was flying in Blackhawks and shooting guns that <laughs> I never do. I'm not a gun guy. Um, but as a character, but as a do. character, yeah. <laughs> shooting fake ones, it was awesome. Uh, but I, I had a boss. I played the chief of station for the CIA mm -hmm. in Caracas, Venezuela, and they, the story takes these men there mm -hmm. in the first episode, and um, and it's sort of how, you know, uh, by the book, chief of station, CIA guy is dealing with these two guys who are not by the book, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and, and what happens in their relationship. I don't want to give away too much, but it's, it was a lot of fun, man. I mean, we had, we had a blast. And John Krasinski, one of the greatest guys yeah. that I've ever had the pleasure of working with, hysterical, and we had, it was rough. It was not easy. We were in uh, Bogota mm. is where we filmed the majority of it. And uh, I lived there for three months. And it was, my family came in the middle for one month, but it was, it was not easy. It was not, you know, shooting in New York or LA. That's for sure. <laughs> no disrespect to the crews there, but they run things a lot differently. And it was, uh, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was Every day was an adventure. And when we all got home, 
we felt very grateful that we were all still alive. <laughs> <I was> gonna, <laughs> Let's put it that way. That you must have been happy to see your family, but at the same time, yeah. you're going, do I want my family to come? I know. I, it was, but it was like, I, they, nothing, you know. Nothing was, against Bogota. Just, no, exactly. But it's, it's not. Um, There's a reputation. Where we were was safe, and, but there were people who, there were, there were problems. There were problems. And we were very happy to all get home alive. Can you just, can you describe one of the problems? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the drivers got pulled out of his truck and knifed, and oh, it no. was, it's crazy. Like, you know, where we stayed was very safe and Was he okay? Beautiful. Yeah, he was okay, thank God. Um, but, you know, you, you couldn't just hop in a cab there. You can take Uber. Uber's very safe. And you can go from the neighborhood you're staying in to another neighborhood that's very safe. But even if it's a couple miles, you don't walk that because in the middle are pockets of bad and you can mm. hop in a cab there and they can take you to, you know, the cab driver is in on it with the person who lives up at the top of the hill and the cab driver gets lost and they, you know, they rob you. Mm. And then the cab driver's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And they take you home and it's like, you know, it's just in, uh, in that way, it's not. Yeah. But it's a very, I, I, I would encourage people to go there. I was blown away by how beautiful. Mm -hmm. The food was amazing. It, it's, it's, an, it's a gorgeous place to visit. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is safe, but you just have to be smart about it. Which you could apply to just about. Yeah. Anything. I mean, New York City. You know what I mean? Be smart. <laughs> You're going to be okay. I, I, look, I was, I was in New York City at the end of the 80s <clears throat> when people were... Not so safe. <laughs> yeah, they were still talking about you know, tourists walking into <laughs> very bad situations. Yeah, yeah. Like From they, block to block. And that's sort of what it's like yeah. there, right? How it can change on a dime. And you're just like, oh, God, I'm not safe anymore. Mm. You know, New York now is very, very safe. But, um, yeah, I was there in the early 90s, and it was very similar. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you for answering all of those questions. But now, here comes the lightning round. The lightning round. And uh, these are questions we're asking of everybody who sits in that chair. Okay. And uh, if you get the answers wrong, then people come out from behind the curtains and drag you all off. Right, I'm okay. <laughs> uh, please, I can protect myself. direct your answers to Two. camera three. Camera three. That's right. So, what was the last show you binge-watched? Last show I binge watched. <laughs> it's, um, it's uh, what's it called? It's not American Ninja Warrior. It's oh, the Ultimate Beastmaster was the last show that I binge watched <laughs> with my kids. Uh, I am that's the one I last binge watched through. Um, but the one I'm currently binge watching is called Black Sunday that a friend of mine, uh, John Himes, directed. For, it's on Netflix as well. I, I don't know about it. Yeah, it's really it's a zombie show. Not necessarily. I did a I did a zombie movie back in the day called Dawn of the Dead. Of course. Um, <laughs> but my friend John uh, directed this season, and they made every episode for like seven hundred fifty thousand uh -huh. dollars. But it's how John he does everything he does is so unique and. He is a director who can take, you know, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for a television episode. For those who don't know, it's not a lot of money. Huh. But what he was able to do with that seven hundred fifty—that's John's thing. It's what he can do with a little bit of money. And they just—they just gave him another two seasons. So I'm really happy for him. But I need to know, especially in terms of Dawn of the Dead, Black Sunday, the zombies walk or run? They run. Oh, very, very fast. They run. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's crazy, and it's—and it's one of those one of those shows where you're. You know, it's a zombie show where you're just like, like, and he's so, the way he tells the stories too is what's so interesting is it's, you know, it just, it just starts and it says Rose. And then you follow Rose through this day mm -hmm. uh, or a very sh a portion of the day. And then the next character comes up and you follow him, but their stories cross. Oh. And you like see the same burning car and you're like, oh my God, wait, so this is the same. This is a minute prior to the 15 minutes you just watched. Oh, cool. And there's like chapters within each episode. Really, it's, it's really, really well done. All right, I'll check it so out. There you go. There's my, I'm my latest. Uh, I'd love to see a, a good zombie show. Um, <clears throat> okay, what classic TV show do you wish you'd been on? Gunsmoke. <laughs> I don't know. No hesitation. <laughs> Gunsmoke. Well, Gunsmoke. Uh, maybe um, Mash. Mash would have been cool. Uh, Bosom Buddies, maybe. Bosom oh, Bosom. Bosom. Well, okay. Gunsmoke. Would you have been a good guy or bad guy? Well, I'd have, you know me, I'd have probably been a bad guy, but I wish, <laughs> like I always, I'd have wished I'd have been the good guy and I'd have been the bad guy. You could, you could have been the guy who wanted to be good, but not to be bad. 
<laughs> uh, in, in back in the day, they didn't really have characters like kind of shaving. Uh, Mash. Maybe would you, I like, maybe I could redo Bosom Buddies. That would be. We should redo that. Oh well, which one would you be, Peter Scolari or Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no hesitation. No hesitation. You have to get somebody. Pretty, I like, I like Tom's career afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of that guy, Tom. Yeah, Hanks. he's done a couple. Yeah, he's been okay. Well, uh, what's the worst job you've ever had? Worst job I've ever had? Well, I, this is so easy. Uh, oh, it's Thai. <laughs> it's not so easy, I guess. Uh, I had two. I, I worked in college. I worked as a temp when I would come home on winter break to get enough money to get me through the next semester for spending money. And no, it's the worst. I. <laughs> There is a thing, I forget my exact title, but it's basically an itemizer. And what you do, what we did was, uh, you would go into a burned house and you would have to itemize every single thing in the home. I guess it's for the insurance companies or yeah. whatever. Um, but it was, and obviously this was the weeks leading up to Christmas, so it was like just this horrific job. Not only would you come home just smelling you couldn't get it out. You would take a shower, you would wash your clothes, and you still smelled like that burnt fire smell. Uh, but you'd see family pictures and a family who lost everything just prior to Christmas or the holidays, whatever holiday you celebrate. And it was just, it, it sucked so bad. <laughs> but I had to work, so that was the, that was the job I got. Okay, I've asked a lot of people that question. You have one of the worst. <laughs> That's one of the worst jobs bad. I've heard about. Pretty bad. It's like a soul killing. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, finally, is there a show, past or present, that you wish would get more acclaim than it's getting? Mm. No, not, not that I can think of. Off the top of my head. They're all getting exactly the right amount of No, I mean, I'm sure there is. I just can't think of one off the top of my head. I'm, I'm sorry, that's your last question. Yeah, that's fair, fair enough. And I sucked at it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you for coming by and answering a lot of questions. This and is killing me, though. What are, what are some of the answers to that? Because I'm like, what is... Oh, well, you know, people, people just say all kinds it, of... It is a problem now, right? Because there's so much content. That so is... it's like how... That's exactly There are the shows it, that are on that you've... I mean, every day someone says to me, have you seen? Yes. No, I have two kids I've not seen. <laughs> and I, I, I'm constantly wrestling with my editor about running uh, stories about the shows that aren't getting enough love, and the, the shows that, that uh, um, came out maybe too late to get the buzz that they need. And she has very good, smart, reasonable answers because she's the greatest editor of all time. <laughs> <laughs> but but then, uh, then I say, Dead to Me isn't getting enough, enough notice, or this show that just came out yeah. is so good. Yeah, there's just, I think it's a, you know, when we were just saying, you know, that, that when you think back, House of Cards was only six years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was the first original streaming show, and now what we have, what the landscape is now, and all the content. Like, is it just a matter of time before, you know, cutting the cable was the way to save money, right? Mm -hmm and just sign up for what you need. And now what you need is going to probably outweigh our cable bill pretty soon, right? <laughs> so yeah, you cut the cable, but All now if you pick up everything yeah. at 9.95, there's a lot of 9.95s now. There are a lot of 9.95s. Um, and now they're more than 9.95. So at, at a certain point, is it going to be <clears throat> Netflix and Amazon acquiring these other, these other streaming services? Or are they all going to coexist and you just got to pick <laughs> or you just splurge and you and you get them all i don't know it's an interesting time and to think that that was only six years ago is fascinating to that's me. right it just absolutely exploded yep. that's what a five yeah. billion dollar capitalization would <laughs> but, you know you you really hit the nail on the head there that there are just <clears throat> too many shows for even people in my job to right fall i can't what you do and yeah. you can't watch everything and i uh, uh, as the greatest editor in the world knows, I'll spend entire days <laughs> binging shows that I have to write about, and I still people still say, "But you haven't watched this, like Killing Eve." Not that somebody in my job would not have seen Killing Eve yet. Which I, I haven't seen it either, no. and I heard it's amazing, amazing. So. Everybody says it, yeah. and I, I love that writer, so it's got to be good. I love her. All right, uh, so thank you there for you have it. coming by. Congratulations you, on the man. run of the show. It's nice what to meet pleasure, you. What a pleasure, Mike. I really appreciate it. To see this entire interview or any of our other Emmy contender chats, please go to latimes.com.